This week, a discussion about correspondence during World War I. Professor Richard Loftus of Mount Mary University examines the correspondence of American Army Private John Warnes, a farmer from a German-American family near Wentworth, South Dakota. So, one time when I was teaching this class during the summer, after a weekend, and we had just finished covering World War I, I came to class and there was a, a box, a shoe box on the front desk, and it had a collection of letters from the World War I era. I found out that that uh, author, the soldier, trained but never went to the Western Front, but he had a brother who did, and his brother's name was Edward Harris. So I got a hold of the Edward Harris correspondence from his family, and I wrote a story about him. He was from Armour, South Dakota. Then this family, after reading that story, got in touch with me and said, we've got all of our father and father-in-law's World War I memorabilia. We'd like to have you take a look at it. So I went to Aberdeen and uh, met Marvin and his wife, Leona. They had a whole garage set up with World War I and other war memorabilia. And they went down in the basement of the house, and they came up, and they set a stack of correspondence on the kitchen table that was about this high. Now, as a historian, I'm looking at that stack, and I'm just going, I wonder what's in there. Now, the problem was, Private Warrens had written a note on the top, and it said, private, not for public viewing. One time when he was showing these items to his family, uh, he, he sensed that they didn't have the proper respect for the items, and so he wrote that note, private, not for public viewing. Marvin, the son-in-law, looked at his wife and said, what should we do? And she said, let's untie the knot. Um, He's been dead since 1952. It's now 2003. I think it's time to tell the story. So needless to say, I'm very lucky and fortunate that they decided to give me the privilege of telling this story. Now, John Warnes was a native of Wentworth, South Dakota, and you're going to see the answers that you need for your study guide embedded in the slides. And at the end of the guide, there's a key in the event that you get confused and you need to go back and look. All the answers are on a key at the end. So this is the family, and each side of this family had deep connections to the country of Germany, both the mother and the father. Um, On the far left is Anna. If you've been reading the book, you've heard a lot about her. And the guy in the back on the right, that's John. Uh, I actually got to meet the last surviving member of this family in 2004. Uh, The girl in the center, her nickname was Dimples. Now, when the war started out, this family having deep connections to Germany... Uh, their natural inclination was to pull for the Germans, for the central powers. When they went to church, they worshipped in German. They wrote letters to each other in German. The parochial school they attended, they were taught in the German language. So if that was the case, like with this family, he had a tendency uh, to support the central powers. People that had connections to the other side would be inclined to support France and Great Britain. So, remember, President Wilson proclaimed that the United States would remain what when it came to World War I? Neutral, exactly. Now, one of John's hobbies was stamp collecting, and he'd met a stamp collector from Grand Forks, North Dakota, and his name was Gill, And Gill is writing a letter to him to explain why 
John hasn't heard from him for a long time. And here's the reason. Gill had an uncle in the German military who invited him to come over. And so he fought with the Germans on the Western Front. Now he's home, and he's going to tell John a bit about the war. He's a great writer. Uh, He writes, War is all right in a way, but having seen some of it, I am inclined to think that Sherman slandered hell when he compared it to war. I am inclined to think that the devil would blush with shame to do some of the things that are perpetrated in the name of war. I never in my worst imaginings pictured war as bad as it really is. While in Brussels, I had my first view of Kaiser Wilhelm, the king of Germany. And no German can look in his eyes and not absorb some of his enthusiasm, some of his patriotism, and some of his love for and faith in Germany. Now, he has uh, diagrams of battles in this letter. And it shows that uh, in 1914... Uh, right around this time of year, in 1914, uh, this is where he was fighting with the Germans, and there was a guy there whose name you might recognize, an Austrian fighting for Germany. Uh, His name was Adolf Hitler. So it's conceivable that Gill rubbed shoulders with Adolf Hitler. Now, uh, letter writing was a primary way of communicating for these people. They'd sometimes work on a letter every day. Not complete it, but work on a page or two. If one of these letters was only six or seven pages long, the writer would apologize for writing a a short letter. This letter is 18 pages long, handwritten, and single-spaced. Now, at the end, he says because of things like the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, we've talked about that, Uh, those kinds of events were turning American public opinion against Germany. And here he is, he's trying to get a job, uh, a government job with the post office. Don't let out my name or occupation in connection with the war as I'm trying to get back into the mail service and it might affect my appointment. Now, Unfortunately for me, he doesn't sign his last name. I just know the address from which he wrote the letter. I've been trying to find out who Gill was for a long time. Now, one of the themes in the book is uh, the attempt by farmers to have an impact on the political process in the form of what was called the Nonpartisan League. They thought that uh, the two major political parties was not really in tune with the needs of farmers. So the way to change that would be to form a league, come up with a set of ideas, and then endorse maybe a candidate from one of the major parties who would support your agenda. It got its start primarily in North Dakota, and then it tries to come down into South Dakota. They thought that rather, for example, shipping your grain from uh, Yankton to Minneapolis and have it ground into flour there, uh, in North Dakota, what they did is they set up a state mill and elevator in Grand Forks. Uh, Rather than just uh, get loans from regional banks, maybe there should be a state bank. North Dakota has a state bank. So John and his father were members of the Nonpartisan League. Now, the two major parties do not like it. So, here's Teddy Roosevelt. Now, this should have some meaning because you've been through the Russian Revolution. Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, comes on the scene and he says that the leaders of the NPL are Bolsheviks. Okay? They take their orders from Lenin and Trotsky. So in an attempt to discredit the Nonpartisan League, this is how Teddy Roosevelt did that. Uh, They're Bolsheviks. 
They're preaching class hatred. At the end there it says, putting the official representatives of the league squarely in the Klan with the Bolshevik leaders who have done such evil in Russia. So you know what happened in Russia when the Bolsheviks took over. So how do you discredit someone? You accuse them of trying to spread those same things to the United States. Now, this was absurd. It was wrong. It was a wild accusation, but it worked. So the NPL gets linked with the Bolsheviks and uh, anyone who wasn't supporting the war. Now, when uh, the leader, A.C. Townley, tried to come into South Dakota, he crossed the border near Britain, which is uh, in north-central South Dakota. They were basically escorted out of town under the threat of physical violence. And when they tried to meet in the town hall in Wentworth, uh, the city would not let him use the town hall. And some supporters of the NPL were actually tarred and feathered, as you can see here. That's what happened to a farmer uh, from near Mitchell. Tarred and feathered, otherwise naked, dragged behind a wagon for miles. Now, this guy was from Laverne, Minnesota, a farmer. He was an NPL member. He was told to leave. They took him to the Iowa border and told him not to come back. He snuck back in and helped with the harvest. They captured him again. They tarred and feathered him. And the people that did this to him were put on trial, and they were acquitted. It was all part of this uh, level of patriotism that had gone off the rails. So I didn't, until I you know, was researching this, I didn't know that anyone in the 20th century had been tarred and feathered. It happened right here in the Midwest. Now, things change when America gets into the war. Remember the phrase Wilson used, make the world safe for democracy. So in this letter, a woman, Ida, writes to John, and she says, you know, when the war started, I was pro-German. Since then, I've done a lot of thinking. Uh, Germany is fighting for a material reason, but we're fighting for a principle making the world safe for democracy. And uh, she's changed. She's gone from being pro-German, but now America has declared war on Germany. So all people who had connections to Germany, who maybe had been educated in German, maybe went to church and spoke in German, they have to switch their allegiance if they're going to be loyal Americans. Now, uh, ten years after she wrote this letter, she married John. Now, John gets drafted, and he becomes a member of the 89th Division. And much of his original training was at Camp Funston in Kansas. Now, what was uh, beginning to sweep around the globe at this time was an epidemic of flu. Uh, one of the places it appeared was Camp Funston. And this is a strain of flu that attacked younger people rather than older people. So 18, 19, 20-year-old guys would get drafted. They'd report. They'd be in good health. Uh, they'd get sick. And their lungs would fill with fluid, and they'd be dead in like three days. So, the epidemic killed around 50 million people, including 625,000 in the United States. They were known as Wood's Division because Leonard Wood was at Camp Funston and uh, directed their basic training. So here's his helmet with the Wood's insignia upon it. Now, imagine being taken from the farm, sent off uh, to training, and you have one month of training, and then you're sent off to go fight on the Western Front. So with one month of training. What we did 
1917 was declare war, and then we had to build an army. Now, here he's being sarcastic. So we had to train an army, we had to feed it, we had to clothe it, we had to get all the weapons ready. I have my uniform now and say, you wouldn't know me. I got two shots in the arm and feel like a whipped dog with a can on my tail. Damn those injections. That's another personal thing I've got against the Kaiser now. I got a good fit all around. My drawers are 36. I wear a 42. My shirt, 44. I wear 42. My pants are a little better, but my blouse is a 40. Four sizes too small, as are my shoes. Oh, it's great. So a lot of these guys had to train with not guns, not weapons, but... uh, actually just pieces of wood shaped like guns because they didn't have enough weapons to go around. Okay, this is a a South Dakota boy going to New York. When we got into New York, we were marched to the Fury Station and crossed the Hudson Bay. It's about five miles across. We were under the Brooklyn Bridge, the largest bridge in the U.S., I guess. My first taste of salt water agreed with me about as much as castor oil does. But oh, the thrill of seeing the Statue of Liberty. I can't describe how I felt, but looking up to this great imposing statue just makes one feel safe. That's about as near as I can come to it. Thanks, Josie. Gill in his letter says, if the Statue of Liberty ever wants to see me again, it's going to have to turn around. Okay, he's not going back to Germany. So, these people traveled around primarily on horse and buggy. They lived six miles from Wentworth, where they could shop. Um, and then they could go into Madison, which is maybe, you know, ten miles away. They'd probably been to Sioux Falls. So, now you're taking people from rural America, and they're going to go to places like New York and Paris. Here he's... Uh, He's all fired up to go to war. The bravado of the new recruit. I'm sure enjoying myself and feeling prouder every day of the machine gun company. I tell you folks, when we get started, the Kaiser's going to move by force. We sure have some hard-boiled guys in this company. I'm afraid I'll be somewhat hard-boiled myself before I get back. We have a bunch of sergeants that every man in the company would stick to until the last. Now, we've learned a bit about the propaganda, how the British began to refer to the Germans as the Huns. Now, this letter that we'll look at next shows how the propaganda efforts of the American government reached even rural South Dakota. So here's an American poster, an American soldier, halt the Hun, the Huns. Remember, the Germans are genetically vicious, was the message. Now, this is his sister, Anna. She's like 18 or 19. This is one of my favorite letters in the collection. She writes, I mentioned in my letter yesterday that R.A. was going to take me to see Over the Top at Madison. They've been to see a movie, and movies were brand new. So they had a huge impact on people. They'd never gone to a theater and seen moving pictures on a screen. Well, we went, Laura Agnes, myself, and R.A. in such a show. I wouldn't take a million for the two hours spent there. I thought the birth of a nation was good, but this was great. There hasn't anything affected me as that play did for ages. Hope you'll have the honor of going over the top as Gary did. Saw a machine gun in motion. Some little crackerjack, ain't it? I'm wishing all the time now that I were a boy. Bet your book I'd be with the colors. By July, I'm going to try and get a chance to get in this last Red Cross nurse call. But don't ask questions in your letters, as this is a secret between you and me. You know what I mean, don't you? R.A. is an alternate and will probably go anyway Friday. He wants to awfully bad. Gee, I can't keep my thoughts from the play, she means movie. I wish 
I could give you a whole account of it. Those darn German officers would like to have had a chance to kill some of them. Agnes says she was so angry that she'd have shot at the screen had she had a revolver. A play like that one is worth seeing. Want the folks to go tonight but don't know whether they will or not. I remain lovingly Sister Tommy. P.S. When you get ready to shoot grapefruit, she means shot at the Huns with the machine gun. Give them an extra dose for me. One time when I read this letter at a conference, the commentator said, they should have sent Anna to the Western Front. Okay, So there it is. Anna had gone to school and been taught in the German language. She'd gone to church, worshipped in the German language. Both her mother and father had deep connections to Germany. But who are the Germans now? They're the Huns. See, so the propaganda effort had reached all the way into rural South Dakota. She liked to dress up in a uniform now and then and smoke some cigarettes. This is uh, John's younger brother, Walter, in front of the farmhouse. In the back, he wrote, I shot this rabbit and skinned it. It weighed eight pounds. We ate the meat, and I sold the skin for 20 cents. Now, <clears throat> further on in question five. There was this avalanche of patriotism that uh, you know, gone, had gone off the rails. So, South Dakota made it illegal to speak in German on the phone. And then, to prove how we're all 100% Americans here in South Dakota, the teaching of all foreign languages, not just German, was declared illegal. So there were people who had been teaching German, let's say in a high school, for maybe 30 years. That was over. In Yankton, high school kids took their German language textbooks and they took them down to the river, they threw them in the Missouri River, then they marched around downtown and they sang patriotic songs. They even burned some... German language textbooks. And not just German. We're not going to learn any foreign languages. So when you go down 8th Street here and take a left, there's a bridge. You cross what we call the Marne Creek. It was the Rhine. But if you're going to go to war against Germany, you don't want a German city, a German creek running through your city. So it was renamed the Marne. Now, you were encouraged to buy war bonds to support the war. In Wentworth, they would publish your name on the front page of the newspaper when you bought a bond. Someone was keeping track. If you didn't buy a bond to support the war, you might wake up some morning on your farm and uh, find that maybe the front of your barn had been painted yellow. Yellow was the color of cowardice. So what happens is there's this German Lutheran parochial school that John and his family had gone to, and the windows were painted yellow. The newspaper said many are of the opinion that this was done by out-of-town parties. You know, somebody from Madison came out here. Even the staunchly patriotic Wentworth Enterprise suggested that things had gone too far. And, uh, you know, the school then said, okay, we're, we're going to end teaching in the German language. Now, John found out about this, and he wrote home. So they painted the schoolhouse yellow. If I were there, somebody would get tarred and feathered. Have you any suspicions? The boys here are all against mob rule, and there's talk of sending soldiers wherever they have trouble. Now, at the congressional level, two major bills were passed. One was the Espionage Act, making it illegal to interfere with the draft 
or encourage disloyalty. And then there was the Sedition Act of 1918, which forbade the use of disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the United States government, its flag, or its armed forces, or that caused others to view the American government or its institutions with contempt. Now, the Sedition Act has been repealed. The Espionage Act is still on the books. Edward Snowden, who's living in exile in Moscow now for his whistleblowing exploits when he was a a contractor for the National Security Agency, if he returns, he's been charged with violation of the Espionage Act. So one of South Dakota's first two senators, Richard Pettigrew, his home is a museum in Sioux Falls now, he was indicted for violation of the Espionage Act. He spoke out against the war. Uh, If you go to his home, he has the indictment hanging on a wall next to the Constitution of the United States. The message is, I was trying to exercise my constitutional rights, but I got indicted. Uh, That case never went to trial. But if you were in a bar or a restaurant or in a public place and you said to somebody that you didn't think the United States should be in the war, your neighbor could go report you and there would be a knock on your door and the authorities would come and they could arrest you. And people went to prison for criticizing the war effort. So, Woodrow Wilson, we got to have total conformity on the home front. His critics, we're fighting a war to make the world safe for democracy and you're making a mockery of democracy on the home front because of these extreme measures. Now, Anna bought a horse and buggy for $75, and she took over her brother's mail route. She delivered mail by horse and buggy. Here she is. She might have been the first woman in the United States to have a mail route because when women delivered mail in World War II, uh, they were often viewed as the first women to have a mail route. But she did it during World War I. Her nickname was Tommy. Now, his pastor took out one of those large yellow legal pads and put it in a typewriter and in a single space letter filling that entire yellow legal pad page, he wrote to John to explain to him that uh, Christians are sometimes called by their countries to go to war. That's something that has to happen sometimes. And when that happens, you're not guilty of breaking the Thou shalt not murder commandment because it is a just war. There are some wars that we must engage in. And uh, so his pastor wrote to him to comfort him and say, Christians can go to war. Now, when his son Marvin went off to fight in the Korean War, he pulled this letter out of the pile and had Marvin read it before he went off to the Korean War. So, uh, one of the themes in the book, his uncle Jake especially writes John letters to encourage him to read his Bible, and even though he can't go to church on the Western Front, you know, regularly because of the wartime conditions, he urges him to, you know, practice his Christian faith. So here he is with his World War I era Bible. Now, One of the social movements in the United States at this time was a drive towards prohibition to get rid of alcohol and wipe our society free from drunkenness. And uh, that will become the 18th Amendment, and it was passed in 1920. When John went off to war, he was a prohibition supporter. 
he's going to change his mind. Dear folks, well, we've been over the top. And I'm writing this letter on a table on which probably a German officer ate this, his bread and drank this Rhine wine. When they left, they left quite a little wine behind. And I'm telling the world I forgot all about being a Prohibition supporter until I was reminded of it by the wine giving out. And then he also writes to request tobacco be sent to him. And at the end of this letter, he makes reference to the Argus Leader, the newspaper in Sioux Falls, and to the 1918 gubernatorial race where Governor Norbeck was trying to get reelected. And uh, he's the governor who was uh, involved in making it very difficult for that nonpartisan league to have any impact on South Dakota politics. Now, war ends on November 11th. And he's going to write home. And here's one of the first letters from the Western Front as the war is ended. Shot up horses and artillery in the cob fields. I feel sorry for them. Poor old grandmothers, hardly able to walk with heavy packs on their backs. Old men bent over with age in rooms of crippled men and young and pretty but tired looking girls. Little children, hardly clothing enough to cover their legs. Hungry looking bunch. The Germans must and will pay for all, all of this and we stay here until they do. Of atrocities such as cutting off children's legs, arms, etc., and committing other horrors that we heard from back home. I have not seen, but the natural horrors that follow a war are horrors as you wouldn't believe without seeing them. Okay. Now, just to show how patriotic they were back in Wentworth, they strung up an effigy of Kaiser Wilhelm and burned it on Main Street. So, we've learned that we got most of our our information about the war from the British. And in many ways, they were trying to draw us into the war. One way to do that was to exaggerate the number of atrocities that German soldiers were committing. Now, any time a large army marches through a country, you're going to have some atrocities. But uh, in this case... It appears that the British exaggerated. And it's interesting because John had heard about the atrocities, but when he's over there, he doesn't see any evidence of them. Okay? Now, John hoped to get home for Christmas in 1918 because the war had ended in November. But he's a fluid German speaker. He can write in German. And so he becomes a member of the Army of Occupation. His job would be to go into a city like this, knock on a door, and explain that they would have to supply a place for some American soldiers to live for a while and and feed them. They would get paid for all of that. It was called billeting. He found the people to be amazingly cooperative. So what Americans were doing is occupying Germany while the peace talks were being conducted in Paris. In the event that the Germans tried to restart the war, we would have Americans in place to prevent that from happening. So their job was to make sure that when the German soldiers came home, they gave up their weapons, that type of thing. Now, as luck would have it, this is where Private Warren's spent Christmas. This is a lot different from Wentworth, South Dakota. This has got a stone bridge. It's got a castle, a stone church. All of those things go back deep into the Middle Ages. In Wentworth, grass was growing on Main Street, as you're going to see. And he got to spend Christmas with a family that had a massive wine business. They had agents in the United States, and they had sold wine, and they'd won contests all around. So he writes home. One sure way of insulting a Saarburger is to be caught drinking water. 
if wine like that could be had at home instead of rotten whiskeys, there never would be any prohibition talk. One enjoys wines here for they do not make one dizzy or give you a headache the morning after. I believe he's speaking from personal experience. Okay? He's, he's had the spins before and he woke up with a hangover. We have wine with our meals, in between, and it's old wine, rich and mellow. Never had anything like it at home. Now, this is too much for Anna. She wrote back. Say, why don't you get your picture taken now in Germany? Ma wants to know if you are so big that you can't get in a picture anymore. Say, I'd rather you talk a little less about that darn wine. Don't you know that we can't get any here? And besides, Mama worries because she's afraid you drink too much. So here he is, uh, a bottle in hand, a glass in hand, and another bottle nearby. He would say that he put on 30 pounds during the occupation, okay? He enjoyed himself. And he actually wrote in some of the letters, he wondered if he'd be able to adjust to regular life where you can't just drink like they did when they were there with the army of occupation. Now, he doesn't get home for Christmas, and uh, this is one of those letters that describes the incredible bond between John and his sister, Anna. So I imagine her finding a quiet corner in the farmhouse after the Christmas festivities and writing this letter. It's a very poignant letter, as as you will see. Well, dear, I do hope you've had a Merry Christmas. Sometimes I wonder how Christmas can be merry this year. How scattered our bunch is. How scattered all over the whole world. And yet, in a way, nearer than ever. In a way, I should be the happiest creature alive, and yet I ain't. My heart has been so close to my mouth all day that I've been afraid to open my mouth. Well, maybe I'll have reason to be truly happy real soon. I hope so. Now for our Christmas. I decorated the room and the tree as usual, except that I put the large Christmas wreath around our beloved service flag. The children were, of course, quite delighted, but I believe we all felt the absence of some important factor. I wanted a letter from you so bad today, but none came. Don't see why you don't write. We've only received one letter since November 11th, and that was dated November 15th. The program was all in American. Okay? The days of going to church and worshiping in German are over. And not as good as usual as they didn't have much time to practice because of the flu. Now, this should sound familiar. People were encouraged to stay home. If they had to go out, they were encouraged to wear masks. They were encouraged to get vaccines. Uh, That was the flu epidemic of 100 years ago. We'll have a party either Sunday or New Year. Better come over for it. I shouldn't enjoy it much, but must do something to get the discontent and longing out of my system. Well, so much of myself. Wish I were in a happier state of mind, but alas, how am I to be? There is no place like home quite as lonesome as home when they aren't all home. Well, so long, kid. Do wish you'd write. I'm just dying by inches to hear from you. Yours with love and kisses, Tom. So this is what Anna looked like. So 100 years ago today, um, this is what people your age look like, how they dressed. On the back, she wrote, This will give you an idea of how stuck up I look since I'm working for Uncle Sam. Ha ha. Guess I have my head up too high anyway. Ha ha. Well, what are you doing now? Suppose you've made a list of every French girl you saw. Ha ha. Your pictures haven't come yet. Be sure and send us the address of the place. Dad is hauling in alfalfa hay today. 
It's dandy. Crops look good. We have the best corn for miles around. Now, his letters that he wrote on the Western Front, you know, the handwriting could get uh, rather erratic given the stressful situation he was in. But now the war is over, and he's on his way home, and he's in Paris, and it's Mother's Day. This letter, the penmanship on this letter is just exquisite. And he writes to his mother, Dear Mother, today's Mother's Day again, and only a year, Mother dear, since I wrote the last Mother's Day letter, but what a year. Soon, just about three more weeks, we will celebrate a real Mother's Day. But today I must tell you, Mother dear, that it was memories of you that made training easy and endurable. Memories of you that gave me backbone and courage when we went up to the front. Memories of you that made it possible to face the hell itself and your prayers that made it possible for me to come through this held nearly without a scratch. And after the armistice, it was again you, Mother, who has kept me on the straight and narrow path as much as a human being can. I can't ever begin to thank you, and I'm not going to try. But when I have returned, I will show my appreciation to the best mother in the world. As things have changed there, so have I changed. All of us who face powder and smoke have. But I'm sure, Mother, you have a son with whom you can be satisfied. He has learned much and has grown 20 years older in thoughts and habit. He sure has seen 20 years go by in 12 short months. Now, Marvin and Leona, the son and daughter-in-law of Private Warren's, were German-Russian genealogical researchers. So they were great with keeping records. You know, writers talk about doing heroic research where they travel around and they try to find uh, the primary documents and I got everything mailed to me. It was in my mailbox. I said, hey, do you have a picture of Dora? And they said, yeah, how about one of her reading a letter from John? That'll work. Now you'll notice she's sitting on the steps at the farmhouse. And when I went went there in 2004, you can see those cement steps underneath this deck. So Leona's on the left and Marvin's in the white on the right, and that's the farmhouse just outside of Wentworth. Now, John found out that uh, some of the letters he was writing home were being published in newspapers like the Sioux City Journal or the Argus Leader from Sioux Falls. He objected and later said the letters were to remain private. So he said, would mention while I think of it that they having been printed, you would send me the letters the Sentinel printed and understand the Sioux City Journal also published one. If you have it, I sure would like to see it. But please, dear folks, don't let any more get in the printer's hands. They can get their letters from better writers. Now listen to this. This is very ironic, given what we're doing today. And I don't like it all, the idea of having strangers read my letters. And besides, it's strictly against rules and regulations. Now, I ask you, do you think the Warrens family made the, cur- the right decision in 2003 when they allowed publication of the letters and of the story? What are your thoughts? Since he wrote private, not for public viewing, so that should they have just left them in the basement? What do you think? Carl. I think it's the right decision because it opens a new window that we can see with this kind of niche little 
window into John's life. And if we didn't get those letters, it would have just been another closed door in history. And we couldn't get that highlight of just one character and really feel what it would have been like during the time. Okay. Anyone else? You know what I think. You know, I, I got to write a book. And I get to travel all around doing meetings like this, uh, presentations like this. So it was one of the biggest breaks I've ever gotten as a historian to have access to this rich set of primary documents. So one time I made this presentation at the uh, South Dakota State Historical Society Convention in Pier, and Marvin and Leona were there. The son and daughter-in-law were there. And when I asked this question, uh, you know, the answer from the crowd was a resounding yes, and Marvin and Leona got a standing ovation. Why preserve all that stuff if it's never going to be accessed and the story is never told? So he'd been dead since 1952. It was 2003. And if you've read the last chapter, Marvin says, if dad were alive today, he would be glad that his story is being told. So <clears throat> I'm kind of lucky that uh, his family disregarded that last statement or thought enough time had gone by. Okay, now when he comes home, despite his lack of confidence in his writing ability, he starts his own newspaper. And I told you, grass grows on the main street of Wentworth, South Dakota. There it is. Now, he carried a pocket diary with him when he was in Europe. And I noticed that uh, he'd have people sign their names in his pocket diary. And I saw the name Matilda Kaiser in his pocket diary. And then I found these letters that Matilda Kaiser wrote to John several decades after the war was over. She and her family, it's after World War II, are living in the American zone of occupation in that divided post-World War II Germany. Now, I was surprised. I would have thought that anyone living in the American sector of a divided Germany wouldn't have, wouldn't have trouble getting enough food to eat, but that was not the case. So she explains to him what it's like. They have enough food. They, they get by, but they're always kind of hungry. They don't have enough to really be satisfied. But it's like uh, to go to bed and have dreams about food. Here she explains, you know, what they get per week and how it's not enough to feed a family. So what John does is, uh, on several occasions, he boxes up a bunch of food, the kind of stuff you could send, you know, to Europe, canned meats, that kind of thing. And he sends packages to this family. And they express their appreciation. Now we're going to have, you know, food to eat. We're going to have a Christmas with, uh, you know, more traditional food. They're so thankful. So, this is in question 13. <clears throat> During the war, John had referred to the Germans as Huns. But 38 years later, he had achieved a sense of reconciliation. He didn't harbor any long-term animosity against the people he had been sent to kill in World War I. So, John was on a couple of odysseys. One took him from a farm in South Dakota to fight on the Western Front, and he returned the other one was, he was drilled into believing, in order to go to war, that the Germans were Huns, but 
decades later, he was back to viewing them as friends and sending them food. So he had achieved a sense of reconciliation, which is a, an odyssey, if you will, of, of his spirit and of his mind. So here he is in his uniform, in the prime of life. This is the woman that wrote him a letter explaining that she'd been pro-German, but now that the United States is at war, she's switched her allegiances. She became his wife. Now, he had been exposed to poisonous gas on the Western Front and had even spent time in a hospital. So he was classified as disabled because of that when he came back. Now, to publish a newspaper at this time, you had a lot of exposure to chemicals. And what we think happened is that exposure to chemicals caused cancer, and he died at the age of 57. And he's buried in a cemetery just a bit south and west of Wentworth. Now, before we go to one last letter, does anyone have any questions about what we've covered today or comment on anything? Okay. Now, for me, one of the best parts about this project, he has two daughters who are still alive and in their 80s. I wanted them to have a chance to see this book. And I know two of his granddaughters. I'm in touch with them. And uh, they never met their grandfather. He died before they were born. Now they have a book about the grandfather they never knew. When you write your essays, if you write an essay that I think they would like to see, with your permission, I'll pass it on to them. And when that happens, you become a part of the project, okay? Because then they have the satisfaction of knowing that their story is being used to teach a new generation about World War I. So, when the book came out, and I sent a copy to one of his daughters, I got this response. I recall your presentation in 2004 in Wentworth and hearing you read the Mother's Day letter, which we read today. Later I shared, because of my dad's war experiences, my childhood was emotionally difficult. I was only 14 years old when he died. As an adult in 2004, listening to you read his Mother's Day letter to my grandmother, Dora Warrens, and later receiving a copy of the letter you read, God gave me a special gift in knowing and coming to understand my dad as a person of compassion and profound integrity. The added blessing, special gift from the Holy Spirit, is the emotional healing, allowing her to forgive her dad from her heart. So, a lot of people write books. I got to write one that helped a woman in her 80s come to terms with her dad. And if that's the only thing the book ever accomplished, accomplishes, it was well worth the effort. All right, thanks for your attention today. Hope to see some of you at the review session tonight at uh, 615 in bead 326. And we'll take the test on Thursday. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. 
The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.